So uh, tail recursive functions. Um, it's a very important uh, power to have uh, your compiler be able to tail call optimize your recursive functions. Um, a bit of sore point using Java is that the Java compiler cannot do tail call optimization. When we're using Kotlin though, we have an advantage is that the Kotlin compiler can perform tail call optimizations in our functions. So um, to be able to see uh, how this tail call optimization can help us, what we'll do is we'll first, of course, uh, try out a very simple recursive function. We'll create a, um, fun a program that generates the nth Fibonacci number. So Fibonacci number sequence looks like this. It starts with one, one, two, three, five, like that. So um, the nth Fibonacci number is basically the sum of the previous and the one more previous Fibonacci number. So like the uh, tenth Fibonacci number would be the sum of the ninth and eighth Fibonacci numbers. Uh, the zeroth and the first Fibonacci number are one and everything else follows this particular process. So uh, a simple function that generates Fibonacci numbers would be pretty simple. We would have one uh, Fibonacci which takes n as an argument, n is going to be of type int and what we'll do is we will uh, return uh, Fibonacci of uh, n minus one uh, plus Fibonacci of uh, n um, minus 2. Uh, of course we need to make sure that we define the return type of the function. Now of course uh, this uh, does not cover the case where n is 0 or 1 so we'll create a base condition if n is 0 or if n is 1 in that case we return 1. So now we can uh, create our main function and uh, we can do uh, print um, Fibonacci 10 equal to, um, we call this Fibonacci function. And if I run this, of course, uh, in my output, you will see that it prints um, 89, which is the correct Fibonacci number for n. Now, uh, if you put a breakpoint on uh, this line, uh, the if condition, and we debug this code instead. So, oh, we'll see like this is the first iteration where n is 10. Now, if you just pass on one more time, you see um, Fibonacci of uh, 10 has uh, led to a call to Fibonacci of 9. And if I just, you know, keep on doing these iterations, we'll see that, you know, the value of n changes and there are like a lot of frames in my stack. So uh, because when I call Fibonacci of n minus one and I call Fibonacci of n minus two at that point, the outer function Fibonacci of n has not yet exited from the call stack, which means uh, by the end of uh, like when I get to the value of n equal to zero, I would have created a whole lot of functions on my stack. So if we keep going on, we see like the stack keeps increasing, which means that uh, the memory usage of this function keeps increasing. And if we provide a sufficiently large value of n here, our program will crash with a stack overflow exception because uh, there won't be enough space in the stack to keep all of these uh, frames. So what we can do is we can think of a better way to write this function. We can write, um, say fun, I'm going to call it opti uh, Fibonacci. So it's a optimized Fibonacci function, which takes n as an argument. It also takes a as an argument, the default value of which is zero, and it takes b as an argument, the default value of which is one. And what I'm going to do is I will call this opti Fibonacci function again with n minus one and uh, I will set the value of a to b and the value of b to a plus b. Okay. Um, and uh, when I reach the lowest number, that is when I reach n equal to um, zero, I will return the value of a plus b. 
So uh, once the function execution starts, like if I uh, try to print, uh, um, let's say I just take the same line of code and now in this time I'm gonna use the optifibnacci function and use it with 10. So it's uh, going to call optifibnacci with nine and it will turn B into uh, one uh, because uh, like initially the condition is one so it will turn B into one and then it will turn uh, uh, the value of A plus B uh, that would also be one. So it goes to the next iteration. When it goes to the next iteration in that case uh, the value of A becomes one, the value of B becomes two. So basically we are able to achieve uh, this entire sequence using uh, the argument B and finally when I return the lowest value of n that is when I reach the end of uh, execution I return the value of a plus b. Um, so if I first of all just run this program let me just see if I get the correct answer or not. Um, uh, so actually I need to uh, do it is uh, return the base condition uh, at sorry I just return b here because uh, I need to do b plus 1 again. So yeah, uh, we do get the correct answer already here. And if I put a breakpoint here and if I run and debug this again, uh, what we'll see is that uh, all of these functions are still getting generated on the frame and the value of the Fibonacci number is inside b. Now, what happens is that since I already create the next Fibonacci number and I'm passing it into this function, this last line of code that I'm writing here, when I end in, uh, when I get to this last line of code, the outer function did not remain on the stack anymore. So the Kotlin compiler has this um, keyword called tail rec, which if I um, add to this function, now, if I add this tail rec function uh, keyword here, you'll see that uh, it gives me an error that I cannot add the tail rec function here because the tail rec keyword can only be added if the last line is a call to the same function and there is no other code after that. So uh, when I add this tail rec uh, keyword and if I put a breakpoint here and I try to run this once again, you'll see something very interesting happening is that if I go across the breakpoints one by one now you can see that uh, the value of uh, n a and b are changing but uh, the stack contains only a single frame the extra frames are not getting created uh, that's because uh, kotlin can optimize a tail call and it would during execution it will turn my recursive function into an iterative function automatically and it would prevent a stack overflow exception. So even if I pass a very large value of n here, I would still be able to execute this program because uh, my stack is not going to increase at the complexity of o, o of n. Okay, my stack's complexity is going to be O of 1 because uh, there's only going to be one function in the stack. So as soon as I go to this return statement, the outer function is removed from the stack and we just pass on to the next function. Now, how is this possible? Because in Java, uh, tail call optimization is not possible. So it's not some special bytecode that's generated. Kotlin is simply uh, converting my recursive function into a um, iterative function. Uh, we can check that out. We can what we do is we can go to tools and we can go to Kotlin and uh, we can uh, show the Kotlin bytecode which uh, generates uh, the you know bytecode for my uh, Kotlin program. Now, of course, uh, reading the bytecode is something that not a lot of people know how to do, but that's fine. We'll just decompile that back into Java, okay? And we'll see what is the equivalent Java code for this Kotlin code that I have written. So the equivalent Java code, as you can see, is that my normal Fibonacci function is, of course, exactly the way I had written. So it returns uh, n, uh, it returns Fibonacci of n minus one plus Fibonacci of n minus two or it returns one when n is zero or one. So it just takes uh, this function and it's exactly the same thing in uh, Java. But let's take a look at the optifibnacci function here. And inside the optifibnacci function, you can say that when n is uh, not zero, it uh, 
creates this temporary variables uh, which is n minus 1 and b and it does b plus equal to a and it uh, puts the value of a from the temporary variable so it basically turns it into a while loop and finally it returns the value of b so while doing uh, the conversion of source code into bytecode the kotlin compiler does the tail call optimization and generates a while loop or a for loop for you uh, instead of uh, having this recursive function so uh, java or jvm itself does not have tail call optimization but the kotlin compiler while compiling a code can do tail call optimization if you have the tail rec keyword written in parentheses function